everybody, welcome to today's lecture where we'll review three theories of the nature of truth. Again, it sounds like a weird thing to talk about, right? The nature of truth. I mean, what is truth? Don't we kind of intuitively know what it means for something to be true? I mean, for instance, if I say there is a table in this room, what would it mean for that to be true? Well, you know, for most of us, it means there actually is a table in the room, right? If I say there is a remote control in my hand, what does it mean for that to be true? For most of us, it means there actually is a remote control in your hand. And again, think about all the conflicts and all the disagreements people have uh, about things. When they say they believe what they believe is true, they mean it actually is that way, right? This is the correspondence theory of truth, right? The correspondence theory of truth says that a belief is true if and only if it corresponds with something that exists in the world. This is kind of like the common everyday understanding of truth, right? How do I know that when I say I'm wearing a, a collared shirt, what does it mean for that to be true? Well, it means that I'm actually wearing a collared shirt. It exists in the I'm It's actually there. I'm actually wearing it, right? So my belief that a table is in the room is true if and only if there actually is a table in the room. Right? This, is how, this is what we mean by truth, isn't it? But what's the problem? Well, as we've seen in our discussions on Kant, and as you know from just basic psychology, you never experience reality as it is. You never experience the world as it is. You only experience the world as your mind shapes it. Everything that you experience, the mind molds. Your mind filters and shapes, and that is really what you experience. So you never experience the world as it is. So when we say the table is in the room, you never actually know <laughs> if the table is in the room, right? You actually you never actually can, can, that's not something you have access to. It's not a statement that says something about the nature of reality. So if we can't know the actual nature of re reality, like whether there's actual tables in the room, how can what does truth mean what can we what can we how can we define truth i mean what else could it mean to say the truth of whether or not this cup is here is dependent on whether or not the cup is actually here I mean, what else could you do what how else could you define what it means to be true well I had you read an excerpt from F.H. Bradley where he talks about another type of epistemology. Let's take a look at this quote. It is all a question of relative contribution to my known world order. The observed fact must agree with our world as already arranged. What's he getting at? He's introducing a type of justification of knowledge. And his way of justifying, justifying knowledge is to say, I know something if it makes sense with everything else I know. You know, if you take a look at a lot of people's beliefs, if you tell, if, like for instance, if, if somebody says, um, yeah, I think there is a leprechaun under my desk with a million dollars. If you just ask them, okay, wait, stand back a little bit. Think about that. Think about what you know about leprechauns. Think about what you know about how the world works. Think about what you know about getting money and, you know, tables. And does that statement make sense to you? Just a simple reflection on everything else you believe would show you that that statement can't be true. This is referred to as coherentism, right? Bradley's philosophy is referred to as coherentism. You justify what you know 
based upon whether or not all of your knowledge coheres, it fits, it makes sense together, right? Does the belief that a leprechaun has a million dollars under your desk actually make sense with what you know of the world? Come on, says Bradley. Well, this form of justifying knowledge is going to lead to a type of truth now. This is the coherence theory of truth. The coherence theory of truth says a belief is true if it coheres with a body of other statements that we take to be true. So when you think of cohere, just think it fits in with your web of beliefs. It fits in with your web of everything else you think you know to be true. So if I say my belief that a table is in the room is true, what I mean when I say that isn't that there actually is a table in the room because none of us can know how reality actually is. When I say my when I say there's a table in the room, that statement is true if it coheres with all the other beliefs I take to be true. Right? I mean, isn't that just how we normally think about it anyway? Like when I say there's a cup in my hand, that statement makes sense to me. It's true if it makes sense to everything else I believe to be true about cups and hands and, you know, the earth and gravity. And <laughs> if it makes sense, it's true, right? But most of us, don't we just talk like that anyway? We say something is true and we believe it because it fits in with everything else we believe. So let's look at, let's parse this out with an explicit example. If I say the table is in the room, it's a true statement if it fits in with every other statement that's part of it. So for instance, a room okay, is a space that can be occupied. Well, what other statements are part of this belief that tables in the room well to be in a room means that something exists in that space okay well what other statements are part of um, my initial belief well tables a table is a piece of furniture with a flat top and one or more legs this is a room i mean think about every other claim that is a part of your web of beliefs pertaining to a table is in the room. Tables, in something, rooms, okay? So if the statement a table is in the room fits in with all those other beliefs, that means it's true. I mean, isn't that the best we got? If we can't know reality actually how it actually is, the best we can do is make sure that whatever statement we say is true fits in with the narrative, fits in with the story we have in our heads about how the world is. I mean, is, isn't that it? I mean, what else do we have? Well, can you think of any problems with this theory? Well, what, what about people that have really jacked up web of beliefs? <laughs> what about racists or Nazis or any people that have a bias? Or how about the people that are... Uh, that, that suffer from, you know, delusions. And, you know, you tell them something that might be obviously false, but if it fits in with their web beliefs, that means it's true? If somebody that suffers from a psychological disorder says, uh, there's dragons flying on this or clinging to the ceiling right now, is it necessarily true just because it fits in with everything they believe about dragons and ceilings and rooms? And if you're talking to somebody that suffers, for, you know, that has prejudice, and they make a statement about African Americans or Asians or Latinos or whites or that's blatantly, you know, racist, does it make the statement true just because it fits in with everything else they believe? It seems to have problems too, right? So. What else could truth be? <laughs> if we can't say truth is how the world is because we don't know how the world is, if we can't say truth is something that, that some, we can't say truth is, is if something fits in with all the other beliefs that we have, then what else can truth be? Well, think about the philosophers we've looked at in our class so far. Can you see where most of them are primarily from? 
what part of the globe they're primarily from. So here we are debating truth, debating how do you know something, and we kind of get stuck, right? What's truth? We don't even know what truth is. Well, guess what? Americans come to the rescue. We have a revolution where American philosophers look at those European philosophers and say, what are you talking about? What do you mean you don't know what truth is? Give me a break. Come on. This question isn't that hard. Let's take a step back and ask ourselves a basic question. When we're talking about truth, like why are we even talking about truth? I mean, what, what's, the, what's the point of truth in the first place? I mean, ask yourself, why? Why would you ever want to know the truth? Isn't it because you want to do something with it? Isn't it because you're wanting to live your life and it's useful to have truth so you know how to live your life or to live your life better? So, William James, who I had you read for today, uh, wrote this in the excerpt from the reading. True ideas, true ideas, true ideas are those that we can assimilate, validate, corroborate, and verify. False ideas are those we cannot. What's the weird part here? I mean, most of this makes sense, right? I mean, false ideas are those that we cannot, uh, cannot what? Well, we can't assimilate, validate, corroborate, verify. Which, which is the weird thing there? What do you mean by assimilate? <laughs> what do you mean true ideas are those that we can assimilate? What does that refer to? This approach that William James the, introduces in your readings is referred to as the pragmatic theory of truth. It's a practical theory of truth. Why is it practical? Well, look at the statement. True ideas are those that we can assimilate, validate, corroborate, verify. What does it all mean? Well, let's start with James. He's going to say, truth is what is useful to believe and has practical value in our lives. A statement is true because you can use it. <laughs> you can use it to build things. You can use it to get someplace. You can use it to make sure you get an A in your exam, to make sure you're not late for employment, to make sure you don't miss your TV show, to make sure you don't piss off your spouse. Truthful Truth is what is useful to believe. John Dewey says it differently, same thing. Truth is what works. How do you, what does it mean for it to be true that there's a cup in my hand? It's because it works. Saying there's a cup in my hand allows me to drink from it. Mm, tasty. When we say F equals MA, right? Force equals mass times acceleration. What does it mean for that equation to be true? It means it works. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's not saying something about absolute reality. It, what matters is that we can use it, right? It allows us to build ships and rockets and projectiles. It allows us to fly planes. It allows us... It allows us to jump out of airplanes with parachutes and know how to land safely. It works. <laughs> Charles S. Pierce is going to say it a little bit differently. Truth, therefore, is tentative. It, it's dependent, right? It's dependent upon scientific inquiry. And if science finds new things, if science tells us new ways of looking at the world, then we have to adjust our truths. Because truth is what works, right? Isn't that what truth is about? The, it takes Americans to come in and say, stop this nonsense talking about truth. Let, let's be really practical about this. Let's again, go back to the quote. True ideas are those that we can assimilate, validate, corroborate, verify. False ideas are those that we cannot. So assimilate means we can use it. <laughs> It makes sense for us, and it helps us to live our lives. <laughs> so let's summarize this. Truth is tentative, no absolutes. Since we can't know how reality actually is, why even search for absolutes? 
right? Truth is measured by workability. So the more it works for you, the more you're able to use it, the more true it is, right? Which means it's working knowledge. As you learn new things, as you live through your life, you might have to change what you believe is true. Three, this means then you should continually be evaluating and reevaluating what you consider to be true. How useful would that be? if we were to take that stance on truth, that stance on knowledge. For you have to remember, it's not about what you want to believe, right? If I say there's a leprechaun with gold or a million dollars under my table, just because I want it to be true doesn't make it true. Because we have to verify it. We have to validate it. It has to be corroborated. I mean, this is just common sense idea of truth. If nobody else can see it, if it doesn't do anything for anybody else, if, if there's no way to validate it, it's not true. It doesn't matter if we can't know reality as it is. Right? We still have ways of corroborating, verifying, verifying validating. It doesn't mean it's going to be for sure true. We admit that, right? It's tentative. It can change through evaluation or reevaluation. We, we're going to admit that, right? But it doesn't mean we can't have truths. It just means we have to let go of the idea that truths are going to necessarily be true forever. Truths are what works. What do you think? James was a philosopher and a psychologist. His hands were in lots of different things, and he was a big figure in both psychology and philosophy. In one of his major works, he looks at religious beliefs. He looks at religious experiences. And he notes that, you know, a lot of people have religious beliefs that other people will say that can't be true. Let's say a belief in God. What would pragmatism say about a belief in God? Well, they may say, if it's useful, if other people corroborate it, if it's something that allows you to do something in the world, if we can't falsify it, I guess it's true. What about other beliefs? Could this lead to anything that you may feel weird about? So, here we are, looking at three different theories of truth. All the way now down to maybe the most practical approach to think about what it means for something to be true. Next class, we're going to take a look at a neo-pragmatic approach, an approach that follows in line from the pragmatists, but, you know, is newer, and we're going to see an extremely practical approach to truth. So practical that the way it looks at truth is so kind of obvious that it's kind of bewildering. We hadn't thought about it sooner. And we'll take a look at that in our next lecture.